All right, let's get started. Um, so today we're going to talk about Java EE programming, and we're going to continue along with JSP. So um, this is the introduction slash everything you ever wanted to know about JSP. Um, and we'll go through this. It's about 88 slides. So I'm going to talk for oh, about an hour, hour and a half to two hours. Uh, then we'll have lunch. <laughs> we'll take a break after this. Um, but if you have to uh, use the restroom or something like that in between, go ahead and come back. Um, you're not going to be rude, I should say. Um, because I guess people at home could pause the video and they can just sit there and go to the bathroom and come back. But you guys have to sit here and listen to it live. So, <laughs> All right. Um, it doesn't mean you can't watch the video later either. So, All right. So let's talk about JSP Java Server Pages. Uh, last time, if you weren't here, we did uh, RMI, JDBC. We did uh, UDP, TCP, IP. Um, we did a lot of stuff already. Uh, so this is weekend number two. And uh, we've covered most of the stuff for the course, ending now with this weekend with JSP, Java Beans, Servlets, uh, Servlet Concepts, uh, which is the focus of this weekend. So the focus of today, right now, is transaction management concepts. So basic concept of the transaction I'm going to cover. Also going to look at web tiering, Servlets, Java Server Pages, uh, which is on the, the menu for this morning. So. So without transactions, we don't have to worry about anything. It's just like the UDP TCP. You know, one client calls up to a server, requests something, sends something to the server, server sends something back. It's really just a two-way communication. And what we're looking at is just a protocol, um, which is UDP or TCP, just to transport information back and forth. When we start looking a little bit past that, we start looking at the concept of a transaction, and this is where JSP comes into place, and also the servlet concepts, and some of the things under managed communication for the Java EE platform. So by definition, a transaction is a group of processes that either all succeed or they all fail. And when I say processes, I could mean processes in the terms of a Linux Unix process, or a uh, task. Task is another word for it. So in terms of a transaction management system or TM is the mecha mechanism for specifying, simplifying, and development of distributed multi-tiered enterprise applications that keep the transaction in mind. So they're transaction aware communications. Standard service offered by J2EE platform uh, by enforcing strict rules on an applications Ability to access and update data, transaction management ensures data integrity. So there's a lot of pros to this. Uh, there's also a lot of cons. You have to set this up and think about it ahead of time. But in terms of the pros, uh, the Java 2 EE platform has um, facilities in there for transaction management, uh, which is part of the tiering concept as well. So it means that the transaction management ensures that a unit of work either fully completes or it has no effect at all and it's not going to like leave garbage around. So it frees the programmer from dealing with the complex issues of data access, synchronized failures, failure recovery, and multi-user programming. So an example of a transaction intense um, environment would be something along the lines of an ATM for a bank. Uh, so I'm going to use the ATM for a bank as a an example as I'm going through the concept of transactions. And here's a here's a picture actually of uh, what it would look like. And you know, in terms of banking, that's probably the most critical application you can think of. If a transaction doesn't occur, you don't want it to partially complete. You know, like I withdrew money out of my account and I was ready to receive it through the ATM in the form of cash and the ATM machine broke or the power was lost or something. Most people would be extremely upset at the bank if they didn't get their money. And they walked into the bank and said, hey, we don't have any record of this. You didn't make any withdrawal. But half of it's out of my account already. You know, people would have problems with that. So in that particular case, if we were doing transaction management, we would make sure that all worked correctly before we actually committed the transaction or actually, you know, dispensed the cash or do anything. And that's, you know, that's one of the reasons why, actually, if you haven't noticed on ATM machines, it goes all the way down to the end, and it practically spits your card out before it gives you the money. <laughs> because it doesn't want to give you the money and then have a problem. Because, you know, obviously the ATM, the bank is watching out for themselves. You know, they don't care if uh, you don't get your money. It's that if 
if you get money that you're not supposed to get is what the issue is. So they're going to make sure that the funds are deducted from your account and everything work correctly before you actually get the money back, um, which is, you know, an order of the transaction. I mean, it's an order of the processing of the transaction. So here's, um, you know, thinking about the order of the processing of the transactions, here's a little scenario here where a customer enters a PIN, enters a card for the ATM, the ATM goes to the bank, verifies, authenticates, come back, start a transaction, you know, select a withdrawal, select the account, select the amount. So if errors occur before this particular perform withdrawal, no problem. It's not that critical. Uh, but withdrawal completed, what happens if the network goes down here dispense the cash. Well, if you broke the link, it's not going to continue and dispense the cash out, essentially. Um, or it might dispense the cash out and then didn't update the account. That would be a problem for the bank. So, Not to say that banks are only looking out for themselves, but you know, you think about the concept. You want to make sure that uh, it's done fairly so you don't have to go back there and clean up the mess. So there's a lot of networking transactions out there that actually still fail at critical parts and uh, there isn't any, you know, I'm just going to say transaction garbage collection that occurs <laughs> or there isn't any, you know, cleanup that happens. Instead, uh, you get, you know, have to call them up on the phone and say, hey, how come my account's locked, you know? Well, that's because, you know, your, you know, we had a bad transaction. We don't know what to do with this. You know, we have a floating something or other out there. So, and most people have heard of the acid test. If not, this is a little review of the concept because we are dealing with the concept of transactions. So it's not a bad idea to kind of think about in terms of good quality transactions. So the, the the mnemonic to be used is acid. So remember these characteristics, and the ACID stands for, the A stands for atomicity, C is consistency, isolation, durability, uh, which gives us our ACID. So what do these terms mean? And uh, it's just like, you know, now you can use this all, all over the town. I'm going to give you the ACID test. Oh, what do you mean by the ACID test? So it's a way of testing in terms of quality to make sure that uh, your application is following, especially once you've designed it these good transaction techniques. So, atomicity. All of the distinct actions that appear to be a single atom or one break of unbreakable whole. So, when you do a withdrawal from an ATM machine, it's like if we've seen in the previous slide here, a couple of different transactions going on, or a couple of different tasks, I should say, that are part of this concept called the transaction. But this all seems to be one. You know, you put the card in, you put the pin in, you select what you want to do. It gives us, like, it's all part of one. And what are we doing while we're withdrawing cash or we're using the ATM? Um, so that the all succeed or the all fail notion exists, which is the first kind of quality that we want to ensure in the application development. And if any of the operations fail, then the transaction must fail and everything must be reverted backwards, uh, which is, you know, not, not a bad thing to do in terms of fault recovery. Consistency. So a transaction must, cons it must, must transition data from one consistent state to another and preserving the data semantics and the referential integrity between the different states, also an important concept. So the system is a sta stable state before the transaction as well as after the transaction. So what we don't want to have is some system go through, perform something, and then figure out, oh, you know, now that we've corrupted the data, you know, now the before doesn't match the after, and we can't reconcile. It's kind of like what happens when people's checkbooks get out of balance. There's not consistent. There's, there's no consistency in terms of what happened. And uh, any temporary work or any transis transitory values are cleared away at the end of the transaction. Uh, bookmarks, placeholders, locks on files, everything like that is cleaned up. It would be part of the consistency, which means you're re retaining a consistent state from transaction to transaction. One transaction doesn't make it so the next transaction is going to fail, or something of that nature. So in terms of the ACID test, isolation. This transaction is isolated from all of the other transactions. This failure is isolated. Isolation means that the changes made to the data by a transaction are invisible to the other concurrent transactions that are occurring until the transaction commits.
Um, isolation is kind of an interesting concept. It uh, requires application design in terms of uh, what's going on. In the old days, uh, very, very, very long, long, long time ago, not possible today, but very, very long time ago, talking about ATMs again, um, you could get multiple ATM cards on the same account. Now, if you have noticed, if you have multiple cards, they have multiple different numbers on them. <laughs> because going back to the concept of a transaction in isolation, if you went, you know, if you had two cards with the same number on the same account and you went to two different ATMs, you could simultaneously withdraw the same money twice without the bank knowing that, you know, the money's not there for the second transaction. So let's say if you had $20 in the account and that's all you had in the account, you could, if you, if you have isolation, which is occurring, and isolation does occur within the transactions, you could withdraw it. Now, you know, the banks are pretty smart to that. Actually, that happened. If the timing was correct, you could do that. Now, each one of the cards has a different card number on it, so you can't mimic two simultaneous transactions. And not only that, but your account will be locked. So, if you've ever had a problem with an ATM machine, you probably have noticed that your account automatically gets locked anyway. So, kind of a kind of a security thing these days. But isolation basically makes it so they're living on an island of their own, and the transaction is going to occur regardless of what else is occurring at the same time. So, hopefully, it's not two withdrawals from the same account for the same amount at the same time. So. Anyway, it requires that several different concurrent transactions must produce the same result in the data uh, as those of the transactions that would occur as if they were executed serially, one right after the other. So in reality, a system, whether it uh, be an application server or a database, will be answering multiple requests in parallel, simultaneously. And, uh, but they would, uh, should be able to be serialized. So you should be able to go through and see which one happened first, which one happened second, third, and roll things back and fix, fix things up, uh, which is to be performed. So serialized means one is performed one at a time, queued up rather than um, assaulting the server all at once. So things actually do happen in serialized format, although they seem like they're happening parallel. So the theory behind it is the same transactions are fed to the server in the same order. It should reach the same ending state, hopefully regardless of the order that those transactions occur. And that's the isolation part, the acid test. And then we have the, the D part, the D uh, durability. We committed the changes and they're permanent and um, nothing is reversing it and that the failures that occur after commit cause no loss of damage or data, hopefully. So it implies that the data for all committed transactions can be recovered after a system or a media failure as well in terms of the acid test. So transaction participants. <clears throat> so an application that uses transactions is called a transactional application. And so let's relate this back to Java EE for a minute. Uh, the transactional applications must consist of multiple servlets, JSP pages, and enterprise pages. So if you think of the concept of, uh, and this is really is kind of um, a continuation of what I was talking about last time we met, uh, a couple weeks, or about a month ago. Um, was it a month ago? I don't know. Three, three, two, or January. Oh yeah, it was, it was a while ago. Okay, it was about a month ago. A little less than a month ago. And we were talking about the tiering, and we were talking about separating out responsibilities among different network components, and the whole multi-tiering um, kind of environment. And uh, I actually mentioned and talked about uh, enterprise beans and, you know, the servlet components and the web server and the application server and the persistent server and all the little different pieces. Well, where it comes into play is when we start assembling these, we're thinking about the acid test and we're thinking about transactions as a concept. And so the transaction application consists of all of these multiple different servlets and all of these JSP pages and all of these enterprise beans that we're going to look at in this, this weekend's lecture, um, all working together to form the, tra the transaction, essentially. And so we can have a transaction manager that keeps track of all of these different components for us to let us know if something has failed, replace a component that has failed, as an example, or you know, reroute the traffic or do something interesting. So resource manager provides and enforces the ACID 
transition uh, transaction properties uh, for specific data and specific operations that exist, and this would be referred to as the resource manager. Um, it's kind of like the RMI that we talked about. I talked about last time uh, the remote method invocation technique. Uh, that there is a register, and the register keeps track of all of the remote objects. And he's kind of like the transaction manager, but he's not really doing. He's doing object brokering. He's not really doing transaction management. But if we think of the concept of the transaction manager and we implement that, then we can break out all the functionality into a bunch of different components and not worry about single failures. We don't have to do like air checking or communication back and forth between the different tiers. So an example of a resource manager might include uh, a relational database which supports persistent storage and relational data an EIS system, enterprise uh, information system, managing transactions, perhaps external functionality and data, and then uh, the Java message service, JMS provider, which manages uh, transactional message delivery, uh, which all work together in this platform to provide that um, asset qualities. So the transaction application accesses a resource manager through a transaction resource object. So we create a transaction resource object to manage the transactions. And for example, a JDBC Java SQL connection object is used to access a relational database. And that's actually considered a lightweight transaction manager. And we looked at JDBC last time. And in the our looking at it, we I went over specifically a lot of the different uh, features in terms of the methods for being able to make sure that that connection was good, the receiving of the result set was good, um, all of the different qualities associated with the connection that are examined and can be troubleshooted through the connection manager. And the connection manager is a resource manager slash transaction manager, managing the transactions to the database. The connector is the resource adapter. Um, so the connector is that driver, as we've seen so far. So the connect in the JDBC connector is the driver that is making the JDBC possible. So the connector is a resource adapter that has an API conforming to the Java connector architecture and the standard architecture for integrating the J2EE applications with an EIS enterprise systems, enterprise information systems is what EIS stands for. So transactional programs must be able to start and end transactions and be able to indicate whether the data changes are to be made permanent or discard them. I'm not saying it's pretty easy, doesn't it? You know, the idea is to automate it, you know, and put some checks in there. And if the checks all work out, commit. If not, roll back. I'll use database terms for you. And so indicating transaction boundaries uh, for a program is called the transaction demarcation. So Transaction demarcation, another vocabulary, and a lot of this is what I'm giving you this morning is vocabulary um, that hopefully you'll be familiar with uh, as we get through the day. Um, so the boundaries is the demark, is marking it, the demarcation. The program starts a transaction by executing a begin operation, and then we have an end at the end. The program then uh, reads and modifies data with the scope of the new active transaction that's occurring. And then when the program is ready to make the changes permanent, it executes a commit operation. Um, this is, would be from the database perspective, JDBC, causing the transaction to, per, uh, to persist uh, and any, any modified data uh, to be you know, committed, to, you know, create during the active state to be saved. And that's why we actually refer to it as a persistent data tier or persistent tier because that's what is going to exist after the transaction. It's going to stay the same. It's not going to, hopefully, it's going to stay the same. It's not going to be corrupted after each one of the transactions that occurs. It's persistent data. So that's the, why the uh, database tier is usually referred to as the persistence tier. <coughs> so successful completion of the complete commit operation results in permanent changes to the transaction resource. So the transactional resource can be updated that things were successful. Or if not, then things aren't going to be committed. So if a commit operation fails, for example, due to inadequate resources or data inconsistency violations or security checks, anything that would cause it to fail, the resource manager executes a rollback, discarding any changes that were made since the transition actually 
uh, began or started. So the rollback would occur to undo anything. An application may also explicitly request a rollback during an active uh, transaction if it can't complete it. So, in terms of uh, the transaction itself, it's complicated by distributed computing, if you think about it. And uh, going back to the tiering, if we distribute everything out over multiple tiers, which means we're putting them out on either logical or physical devices. Then we have distributed transactions. If we're communicating, you know, a persistent tier that's communicating with a Java Bean enterprise server that is communicating with a web server that's communicating with an application server, well, you've got distributed transactions that are distributed among all of the different components that are involved. So by definition, distributed Enterprise systems often uh, need to access and update multiple transactional resources in order to accomplish some business goal among the business tiering. And the distributed transactions are more complex than non-distributed ones, obviously, because you have the network failures and you have all the different components that are involved. If everything were all on one computer, we would not be having this lecture. <laughs> what would it matter? If, all, if everything was in one program, it doesn't really matter. You just do some error checking on the program. You know. But if we distributed it out all over the place, we might have things like transactions that uh, you know become issues or they're more complex in terms of transactions because of the latency of the network, that potential failures, or one or more resource managers becoming unavailable, interoperability concerns, lost connections, down servers, all sorts of different things that might happen. So on a network, a failed transaction can be difficult to distinguish from one that is merely slow. Um, which is why a lot of things have timeouts in them. Uh, so if the database server doesn't respond within a certain amount of time, then you're going to come back and you're going to roll back something and you're not going to commit uh, a withdrawal or something. So resource managers that do not know about each other cannot coordinate transactions or do anything themselves. So the transactional application could itself... Um, Handle rollbacks commit uh, multiple different distributed resources, but only at a cost of a great deal of complexity, no reusable logic. So if everybody was thinking on their own, each one of these servers was basically a self-contained island of its own, and it was doing it, it would work just fine. However, there's no communication. You're taking away that distributed kind of transparency between the different computers. So a transaction context is the association of the transaction with the application component of the resource manager. It's referred to as the context of the transaction. And a transparent forwarding or a transaction content from one component to another or from one component to a resource manager is called a trans transaction content propagation. So we propagate the content of the transaction over multiple server units or over multiple distributed parts. So let's talk about the transaction manager. So what I gave you up to this point is a lot of vocabulary, a lot of terminology. Some of you may have had it before from different contexts, but it all applies to the Java EE platform. And uh, the center of it all is this transaction manager. And so the most common solution to the problem of coordinated and distributed transaction is to introduce this third participant. Why is it a third participant? Well, it's not the application, it's not the data. It's the transaction manager who's the middleman between the application and the data. And he's making sure that things are in, in sync correctly. That your account was updated before the money was given to you from an ATM perspective. So the transaction manager acts as the mediator between the application and the multiple resources that the application uses, whether it be a database, whether it be a file server, network, other network components. And at any time during the distributed transaction, transaction manager maintains the association between each one of the transactions, has to keep track of how many simultaneous transactions are occurring. Um, which might be a unique global ID per transaction, transaction one, two, three. Um, application threads that might exist, any connections to resource managers, and things of that nature. Here's what it looks like if you wanted a picture. A lot of people like pictures. This is kind of blurry a little bit, but 
I'm not quite sure why. <coughs> the uh, resolution is kind of bad on my boxes that are blown up. So this is the distributed transaction participants. Up here we have the transaction manager who is communicating with the resource manager. And then we have the transactional application itself. So the application goes to the transaction manager. And this is the demarcation. This is the transaction demarcation when it goes over and ask the transaction manager for something. And then we actually could ask the resource manager, Do, are the resources available? Is anybody else using it? Uh, and then we have protocols that go back and forth between the transaction manager and the resource manager. So that's really the big picture of how the middleman, the transaction manager, actually kind of fits into the picture. <coughs> So one of the things that, uh, from a primitive Unix perspective, and a lot of this actually kind of breaks down the Unix thread processing. You think of the concept, multiple threads working together are sort of like multiple transactions working together. And if you had two transactions going on, actually this is the interesting thing, and if anyone's ever, actually I've never worked in banking, but I've heard so many stories about it, it usually lends itself as a good example. Um, if you, have, if you have, haven't noticed, like, you know, when you deposit and you withdraw, the deposit's always clear first and the withdrawal is always clear second. <laughs> so, you know, because you can't spend money unless you have money, right? So, you know, at night when everything reconciles in the banking world, the, um, the withdrawals always go second, which is kind of interesting. Because if the withdrawals went first and the deposits went second, then you might over withdraw your account. You might not have the funds available. So some of it is done in terms of a lock. So like say for example you have five withdrawals and if you haven't, you know, actually most banking still runs this way actually at night everything reconciles. So during the day all these transactions occur and then at night the computer accumulates and makes them all permanent or rolls them back or does something to make sure everything is consistent because even if you're off by a penny if it's a million customers you know that's a million pennies <laughs> so that's, that's a lot of money in the long run so they need to be very accurate in terms of their transaction processing so a lot of times things will lock in fact when you do a withdrawal excuse me when you do a deposit during the day it'll lock you know like and then say well how come it does oh clears at midnight you know your account shows the money the money really isn't there because it has to wait to make sure that the person who gave you the money actually has the money to give you. So your check clears. So it's really a lock and a hold kind of mechanism, which is very similar to Unix processing. In Unix, multi-threaded processing and inter process communication and using a lock and a mutex, essentially, um, which is going to end up happening. So databases are just like applications. You can lock a transaction, you can lock um, an update, you can commit an update, um, you can manage all of these different, and it's the business logic that somebody has to program into the application. It just doesn't happen on its own. <clears throat> so the usual solution is simultaneous access to shared resources, and the shared resource might be your bank account, is to employ a locking device called a lock in a database or a mutex in an operating system. A mutex and a lock are pretty much the same thing. One's from a Unix perspective, the other one's a database term. So the lock is a method for ensuring that only one process has exclusive privileges to change the state of a resource at a time, which means you have a mutual exclusion. You know, you've got a critical section of the program, and only one thing is going to go in and touch it, which is what happens when you put your card into an ATM machine and you open up your account. Well, somebody else can't do the same thing anymore. It locks it. So you can't, um, you know, trick the system into thinking that, um, you know, taking the same money out twice or something. Should multiple requests require access to the same resource, such as a record of a <coughs> customer's bank account, then only one is allowed to access the resource at a time, and then, the, you know, it's one at, one at a time kind of going in. It's a mutual exclusion, actually. It's a goes right back down the operating systems in terms of that concept. So here's an ATM example uh, that we used before. When the verification of the account takes place, a lock is placed upon the part particular row to ensure that it remains active as if it, until the um, 
remains exactly the same until the transaction is completed. So nothing else in the background is going to come in and open it up and take funds out. So it's kind of like a read before write. You know, it wants to make sure the read value is correct. So at this time, the customer account has been deleted. It would either fall, it would either fail, or have to wait for the ATM process that would acquire the lock until the customer's account was opened up again and they were able to actually use it. <coughs> so this wait would ensure that the account, <coughs> if it was closed, the account, the uh, customer <coughs> would receive only what was left in her account. Which means if you open it up twice and there's a lock on the first one, you can't withdraw the same money twice, essentially. You can't. And you know, when you think about the concept, banks are only concerned with you taking money that doesn't belong to you. So when you put money in, they don't really care how long it takes for that check to clear. They're going to lock it until you know, they actually have their funds. So in terms of locking, the basic problem is that the lock is required for both reading and writing of a particular resource for consistency's sake. So if you read an item and it wasn't locked, something in the background might change the item. And then your read is out of date. And vice versa, the same thing actually true with the write. If you wrote something and somebody else had it open for read, their read isn't going to be updated with your write. So it's a reader-writer kind of issue or scenario. And it ensures consistency. So you could possibly imagine what the locks actually end up having in terms of a side effect. Well, it causes latency. It slows everything down if it's locked. So things have to wait. And if we have serial transactions going on, one right after the other, it makes our transactions process a lot slower. So although we want to maintain the transaction concept, <coughs> we don't want to slow the system down completely. So in the second process, <coughs> if the first process <coughs> were to open up and read something, the second process were to read a row from a database while it was in use and being modified by somebody else, it might not receive the accurate value. And for lengthy transactions, any other process might have to wait until the read is actually a single value. Or, you know, wait until it's something has been returned or locked or released, I should say, uh, before it can actually open it up. So locking issues doesn't scale well. If you have one resource and you have a lot of people using it, and eh, forget it. <laughs> it's too slow. So the concept of shadow pages is another choice. So, in effect, the database makes a copy of the data that is being undergoing change. And you're working on the copy, which is going to be the shadow copy, not the deep copy, uh, in retrospect. So one copy of the data is the pre-transaction copy or the original copy, and then the other copy is the new copy, is the changed copy. So one copy is undergoing change. All of the read requests are forwarded to the pre-transaction copy. And then the changes can be merged. So it might be ignorant of any changes that are underway while other people are changing it. It's almost like when you take, um, actually this is a good example. If you take <coughs> and you're in a company and you're all working on the same Word document and you pass the Word document around by email, everyone has a copy of it and people start making changes to it. Not like Google Docs <laughs> or Google Docs, everybody's sharing one copy of it. So it's harder to reconcile all of the individual changes when everybody else has their own copy. So although nothing is locked, you can still work on it. The merging of the changes and the reconciliation of the transaction is a lot slower. <laughs> so you got your choice. The banking system does a shadow copy. You, know, you have a copy of what's current. The bank's got a copy of what's current. Other views of the system has a copy of what's current. At midnight, the end of the night, when everything is merged together, that's when all the deposits come in first and the withdrawals come out second, and there's an order to this chaos in terms of the reconciliation, and they call it recon, you know, reconciliation to, um, <coughs> to um, commit all of the transactions and put everything back together. And at the end of the day, in the morning, you got a balance, and the balance is your copy for the rest of that day. And then at night, the balance changes. And then, you know, depending upon what happens during the day. So should the second copy uh, process decide to make its own changes, it will be locked. <laughs>
uh, blocked by the lock uh, in the shadow copy uh, for the data that has to wait. So here's an example of a, the reader-writer scenario where you have writer number one and writer number two over here. Reader number one, reader number two over here. And, uh, you know, assuming we have multiple transactions going on. <coughs> writer number one has a write request, goes to the resource manager. And what you're looking at in the middle is the middle, guy, middle man here, the resource manager. He says, I want to write something. And then the reader says, well, I want to read something. So he goes to the reader and says, read fulfilled. Write privilege granted. So the lock was created. Now we have the write granted. And then the write command is given. And then let's say reader number two comes over here and it requests. Uh, so another read request. And then the read request is fulfilled from a shadow copy. So it's taking a copy of whatever happens to be the current state of stuff from the resource. And while the block is waiting, it goes over here and says, well, write complete here. And the resource manager is just orchestrating the um, uh, how serial everything is and wh which, which transaction is occurring before another and which copy of the current state of the data is actually delivered. So. This is really just, you know, this slide is really just showing you the job of the resource manager in terms of how it fits into the big picture. <coughs> now, instead of uh, and what we've been talking about is a one phase kind of write, it's kind of a lock and a release, a lock and a release. We can come up with a two phase commit protocol where the resource managers uh, manager does that do not know about one uh, one excuse me don't know about each other can't operate directly on distributed transactions if they're not aware about what, which everybody everybody's doing so transaction manager controls the transaction indicates to a resource manager whether the when and where to roll back or to commit based on the global state of the transaction transaction manager coordinates the transactions between the resource managers using a two phase commit protocol Basically, two steps instead of one to commit it. Two-phase commit protocol provides the ACID property of transactions across multiple resources. So in the first phase of the two-phase commit, the transaction manager tells each resource to prepare to commit. <laughs> I'm getting ready to change your data. So it comes in and says prepare. So perform all the operations for the commit and be ready either to make the change permanent or undo the changes meaning it takes everything it has and says, can I go ahead and apply these changes? And is it going to ruin the consistency or integrity of this resource? And that was the first request. And then the second request, each, each after each resource manager responds, indicating whether or not to prepare the operation or whether or not it's going to be successful or not. Then in the second phase, if all prepared operations succeed, the transaction manager tells it to, okay, so submit it. It's almost like doing a check first, which makes it the two-phase. So you go in and you ask the resource manager, can I make this change? And then the resource manager comes back and says, yeah, okay. And then you make the change. So it's two calls instead of one. So just like, make the change, make the change, make the change. Because what will end up happening, let's say if it comes back and says, no, you can't do that right now because somebody else has the resource open, and then it'll stall. It'll take the, take the transactions out of order, because if you think about it, this is transaction processing. So if it has other transactions in a queue waiting, and they're all asking, some of the other ones might be able to go first. As an example, the withdrawals and the deposits. You know, if the de withdrawal comes in, can I, can I commit? Can I commit? You know, the resource manager is going to say, no, 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 we still got some deposits out there we need to reconcile. Otherwise, the end result isn't going to be right, perhaps. So, you know, if we take the pluses and the minuses all together, we might end up charging the customer some overdraft fees because we considered all of their withdrawals before we considered any of their deposits. So, <coughs> otherwise, a rollback, if a commit doesn't exist, a rollback is going to occur and indicates the transaction failed. All right, so Java 2 EEE platform transactions. Supports a combination of servlets and JSP pages accessing multiple enterprise beans within a single transaction. This is where it all fits in together. So each component may acquire multiple connections to multiple resource managers 
And the TE platform supports both programmatic and declarative transaction demarcation. So we can mark the component pieces as part of a particular transaction, check to see if they all worked, then commit or roll back depending upon what we're looking at. So the transaction management is transparent to the component and the application code. It's the resource manager essence, in essence. So J2E application server implements the necessary low-level transaction protocols, such as interactions between the transaction manager and resource managers and distributed two-phase commit protocol. So it does it for us, so we don't actually have to think of any of these manual concepts. And it requires only support for so-called flat transactions, which cannot have any children or nested transactions. And that's the interesting component. <clears throat> so a transaction is a transaction, but what if a transaction has a sub-transaction part of it? Um, it's really hard to control sub-transactions. So if you break everything out into a flat level, it means everything is considered of an equal um, participant in the transaction. You don't have any subs. So we don't have any priorities for which ones need to go first or second or third. It's all on the same level. So here's an example of transactions across multiple resource managers. And you might think, well, what are the resource managers? Well, they might be the beans. So the following scenario illustrates the transaction that spans multiple resource managers. Here's our J2EE server. We have our client that connects. And then we have this transaction here. And the transaction could be the database, the name, uh, service, the EIS, enterprise um, environment. We could have, and these are application servers perhaps, we have Bean X, Y, and Z. So we create, and what, are, what is a Bean? It's a Java program, and it rides on the server, and it acts like the transition manager. It's in charge of a particular resource. And uh, we looked at this actually when we looked at JDBC already in terms of the database connectivity. If we have a bean out here, then the bean connects to the database. The bean is actually uh, its responsibility in terms of the management of that resource is to manage not only the connection, but the state of the database, any updates that are going on. And the client doesn't work directly with the database. Instead, the client goes to the bean or to a web server that goes to the bean that goes to the database. So we tear it off. And then we can make sure that uh, we have the correct control over the resource. So, Client invokes a method on enterprise bean x. This is enterprise bean x. Client comes in and uh, let's say client, and, and, and this is where all these technologies fit together a little bit. Let's say this is an RMI connection. It could be. Or let's say it's um, you know on some other middleware. It doesn't really matter what it is. Client's coming in, and the client is, is requesting a service from Bean X. Bean X accesses database A using a JDBC connection. That's what we've seen so far, actually, um, in terms of that connectivity. Actually, we used JDBC when we went directly to the database. We didn't go through a Bean, uh, but we could very well have made it go through a Bean. Actually, we could create the JDBC connection on the Bean, which is how it should work. And then our application just calls the remote object. That's the bean that goes and connects to the database. It uses the connector driver. So the, then the enterprise bean X calls a method on another enterprise bean Y, uh, which sends the JMS message to some other system using the JMS service provider. It's a JMS provider, message, message service provider. This is JMS stands for Java Message Service. And I uh, talked to you a little bit about that, I think, in the first weekend as well. Um, and then enterprise being Y then invokes a method on enterprise being Z, uh, then uh, which updates and returns some data from an ex external EIS system using a resource adapter that implements a J2E connector architecture. So being X, talking to being Y, talking to being Z, also talking this way. So the beans themselves are talking together. So the transaction manager of the Java 2 EE server uh, coordinates activities with the three resource managers. So the resource managers are the beans that are managing the access to that resource. And then the transaction manager is the persistent 
is the is the tiering in terms of the servlet environment or the server that we have it all put on. And the server ensures that the database update by being X and uh, the message transmission by being Y and the EIS operation performed by being Z are either all committed or are they rolled back if they don't work. So if we have a transaction manager that's watching over the whole system, then we can do the checks on the different resource managers. So. Do you need it? Well, possibly. If you're going to make sure, if you're going to have distributed applications and distributed transactions occurring over multiple computers, you know, you're, you're going to configure the environment to facilitate this type of communication, this type of tiering. Here's a transaction across Java 2 EE servers. So the products can distribute transactions across multiple application servers. So here's the client, and the client's going into one server, the client's going into another server. So the difference here is instead of putting it all on one server, we have it on multiple servers. So we tiered it out, um, which just means we've separated it out. It's going to run pretty much the same in terms of its connectivity involvement. Um, it's the only thing different is we have multiple servers. So client invokes enterprise bean X, which updates data in, enter in the information enterprise information system on A. Oops. <coughs> the enterprise information system here is controlled by bean X, and uh, then calls another enterprise bean Y that's hosted on a different server. So bean Y is on a different server. And then enterprise bean Y performs a read write access to enterprise bean information system on number B. Oops. So bean Y only controls B. So bean Y is not going to touch A. And bean X isn't going to touch B. It's all controlled by its own separate resource manager. <coughs> and then uh, when X invokes Y and the two servers cooperate and perform propagate the transaction context from X to Y, the transaction context propagation is transparent to the application code. And this is where those terms are coming into play now. The context propagation is transparent, which means we don't know that it's on two separate servers, and we don't know that these resources are out here, actually. We don't care. We just log into the server. So at the transaction commit time, the two servers use the distributed two-phase protocol to ensure that the two enterprise information systems are updated with a single transaction. So it's using a two-phase kind of protocol that says, hey, are we able to update? Yes. Okay. <coughs> so here's where it fits in in terms of the transaction technologies, part of the components. And uh, no, you don't have to program in this for this class uh, because you need, in order to actually do this, you're going to have to set up transactions and you're going to have to set up tiering. It's a huge project. You're not going to do this until you actually have you know, servers uh, and you have applications on those servers and beans created. And it takes a lot of, um, you can't just mimic this on a computer. It's, it's, it's kind of a little bit more challenging than that. <laughs> so, well, we're not going to implement it, but we'll I'll, I'll definitely be showing you some of this API stuff. So the Java Transaction API <coughs> performs the specifications defined in the overall transaction behavior. So it's the Transaction API. It's part of the EE, uh, or short for GTA, Java Transaction API. Specifies, defines, and contracts between the applications, the application servers, the resource managers, and the transaction managers. So we configure the API to perform the transaction management between all of the different components. So defines requirements for the transaction management and the runtime environment. So it specifies standard Java interfaces between a transaction manager and the distributed application participants. Um, that it's trying to coordinate applications, application servers, resource managers. Defines the interfaces that will let the applications, the application servers, everybody else participate regardless of their implementations. So they all can be implemented using, well, it's all going to be in Java, but it's going to be in you know multiple different types of technologies. It's implementation independent. The transaction manager API is going to essentially you know, be a blanket, um, actually act sort of like middleware to all of it. 
Um, so when the transaction is managed and coordinated by this particular API, and it spans multiple components, enterprise information systems, and it propagates automatically between components um, to access components with, within the transactions themselves. And here's an example on the bottom of the screen. Uh, for example, a JTA transaction may comprise of a servlet or JSP page accessing multiple enterprise beans, some of which access one or more resource managers. So what exactly it's managing is unknown. I mean, it's not unknown, but it, it's uh, not like a pre-configuration. It's not like um, it's not like RMI where we can you know ro load a registry, load a interface, load the objects, connect to the objects. It's um, it depends on what you're doing actually. It depends on what you have loaded and what services and beans you're using as to what the transaction management manager is actually going to be taking care of. So the uh, GTA, the Java Transaction API, begins either explicitly in the code or implicitly. Um, by an enterprise Java Bean server. So it can be started automatically or you can actually call it, make an instance of the object in your source code and manually configure the object to take care of these transactions. And uh, it's just basically uh, managing. I mean, it's, it's a manager. It's managing the different states of the applications. So the component can explicitly begin a JTA transaction using the interface. And here's the interface for it right here, Java X transaction. So the main benefit of using the uh, transaction is the ability to combine multiple components of enterprise information system access into one single transaction uh, with little programming effort. Actually, it's almost as much effort as JDBC, uh, which is not very much effort. So, so the uh, platform itself propagates transactions between multiple components and enterprise information systems with no additional programming effort, essentially. We just create an object and we call it the transaction object. Well, it is an object. It's going to be an instance of a transaction. And then we add components to the object. And the transaction can be managed. So client tier transactions, because we've been talking about so far server tier transactions. So the Java 2 EE uh, platform does not require transaction support in applets and application clients uh, though like distributed transactions, Java 2 EE products might choose to provide this capability for added value. Um, this is all done on the server, long story short. Um, if you wanted to, no one uses applets anymore anyway, but back when applets were popular, if you wanted to, you had to manually incorporate the applet control into the transaction manager. It wasn't actually you know, something that was going to be provided automatically. So you manually connected it in terms of the support for the transaction. Um, so to ensure portability, applets, application clients should delegate transactional work to enterprise beans. Let, let them do it on the server, either directly or by way of their web tier. Make a bean function out of it. And bean function are just small little, I don't know why they call them beans, I guess because they're small, small little Java programs. They're just like Java applications, but they're beans. People get caught up on the terminology. You know, I don't know how to create a bean. Looks and acts like a regular Java program. It is a Java program. <laughs> so <clears throat> it's called a bean because it's so small and it it acts like a resource manager. It's the terminology. So web tier transaction guidelines. We know about the web tier from last time. Servlets and JSP pages in a two-tiered application can access enterprise information systems within the scope of the JTA transaction. And the servlets and the JSP pages support only programmatic trans transaction demarcation, meaning it's done inside of the source code for the programs, and it's done programmatically. There's no resource manager slash transaction manager that is being supported outside of the Java programs themselves. A servlet or a JSP page can use the Java name, the name, uh, look at the J JNDI to look up a, and I have some more information on that in a few minutes, to look up the user transaction object using a standard defined name, and that's going to be, uh, you know, from the user transaction object, and then use the tra user transaction interface to demarcate the transactions.
So we can look up the object, find it, and then use the objects transaction object functionality to uh, create the demarcation. Here's an example that illustrates the use of the JTA user transaction interface. What we're doing, we're just creating a user transaction object instance, UT, and it's going to be looking up a looking up from a, the J J Java naming um, system. Don't be concerned with the source code, and as I mentioned already, you don't have to program using this. For this course, we don't have any programs that require you to create a transaction manager. It would be kind of hard to come up with an assignment for it. So. Enterprise Java Bean Tier Transactions. Let's talk a little bit more about those beans. Enterprise beans offer two types of transaction demarcation. Bean managed and container managed. So this gets kind of kind of hairy after a while, but we you know, now we're familiar with the word bean, hopefully. Small Java program. You throw a bunch of beans in a coffee jar, <laughs> coffee can, <coughs> and that's a container holds all the beans, right? You know, who goes to the store and buys one java bean at a time? Actually, you can buy one java. You can buy one piece of coffee bean at a time. Kind of stupid. Usually you take a scoop and you get a lot of beans and you throw them in a plastic bag or something, and you get a container of beans, which is kind of like what you're doing in java. This parallel is identical. Instead of having just one bean on an island of its own out there working with a JDBC server or something like that, we create containers of beans. We stick all the beans in the container. And then we have the container that we can wrap support around, load the container, unload the container, swap the container with another container, and then deal with the beans as a kind of a whole lot of beans all together instead of each bean individually, which is the same parallel as coffee beans, actually. So we have container-managed beans instead of bean-managed beans. In a container-managed transaction demarcation, uh, we have six different transactions or attributes that can occur, whether it's required, requires new, not supported, supports, mandatory, and never. We have no container-managed, it would be never. So the application component provider or the assembler specifies the type of transaction demarcation and the transaction attributes for the methods of the enterprise being in the deployment. Uh, descriptor. So the enterprise mean itself in terms of the transaction demarcation uses this API here, uh, user transaction, the same one we saw before, part of transaction interface to explicitly demark transaction boundaries. This is for the bean managed component. Session beans and message driven beans can choose to use bean managed demarcation. And entity beans must always use container managed uh, transaction demarcation. So entity beans are going to be a part of uh, the servlet environments. And uh, if you're going to load them all up together, then you're going to you're going to put them in a container. So bean managed transactions. The following pseudocode illustrates the kind of fine grain control that you can obtain with a bean managed transaction. By checking various different conditions, the pseudocode des decides whether to stop or to start different transactions with business methods. So it's just going to look at it, you know, an example, you know, begin the transaction, update table A. If some condition exists, then commit the transaction. If not, don't do it. Um, so what you're doing is you're creating these transaction objects to do checks. It's a way of cross-checking to make sure that updates have occurred correctly, uh, failures did not occur. So. so enterprise being using a JTA transaction, there's a sample source code for it. We would begin, we would commit, begin the uh, user transaction object, which basically means start it, perform the transaction, the work that's going to be you know, occurring and then stop it. So imagine the bean running along. It's almost like, um, hmm. no, I can't think of anything else like this. I was going to say it's almost like JUnit or unit testing where you've got, if you're familiar with the concept, especially with Eclipse, you could load up test cases that are running and are being built simultaneously with your Java classes. And you can run them, you can run the program simultaneously, sort of, mm, but not really, still manual. This is more automatic, 
So it's not really that good of a parallel, but it's very similar. The transaction bean is running along with the other bean. It's like multiple running objects simultaneously. So the user transaction <coughs> interface is used the same way as the Java uh, Enterprise Java Bean tier, as in the web tier, except that the reference is to the interface is obtained by calling the context get user transaction instead of by way of the, the, the name lookup through the server. All right, so the flip side of that, if we're not going to do it bean managed, we'll do a container managed transaction demarcation. And so that the messages have, um, the container manages the transaction boundaries of the enterprise bean. They use a container managed uh, approach. So the transaction or attributes of an enterprise bean method determines the method's transactional semantics, determines the behavior of the enterprise bean container must provide when the, the method is called. So the behavior that's supposed to occur um, upon method invocation and transaction attributes are associated with the enterprise bean methods of the bean's deployment descriptor. So it's done per container. As an example, uh, with a new if a method has a transaction attribute requires new, then the enterprise bean container begins the new um, transaction uh, API transaction object every time this method is called and attempts to commit the transaction before the method returns because it requires a new one, so it calls it, brings it up. So you're, you know, explicitly specifying when the bean is actually going to be used and what methods are actually going to be called. Um, so the same transaction attribute can be specified for all the, of the different methods inside of the enterprise bean, or different attributes can be specified for each one of the methods of the beans. So um, you can customize it per bean, I think this is saying, inside of the container. So in the container managed demarcation, an enterprise bean has some control over the transaction. Um, so as an example, the enterprise bean can choose to roll back a transaction stated by the container using the method set rollback only um, on the session context, entity context, or the message driven context object. So the bean itself has a, has a mind it can think <laughs> and it can decide when it's going to roll back something. The benefits of using container managed transaction demarcation. Alright, so the benefits, the transaction behavior of the enterprise bean is specifically declarative instead of programmatically. So in the other bean managed, it was inside of the bean code. We're programming it in. In the container, we're doing it from the outside and just controlling multiple beans. So it frees the application component provider from writing transaction demarcation code in the component. We don't have to do it in the component. <coughs> so it's less error prone because the container handles transaction demarcation automatically. So we don't just explicitly call it. And it is easier to compose multiple enterprise beans to perform a certain task with specific transaction behavior. So an application assembler that understands the application can customize the transaction attributes and deployment descriptors without any code modification. So transaction attributes. And don't worry if it's just starting to get a little dry. It does get dry. There's, I, I might actually end in about 20 minutes, actually, because this slide set is 88 slides, and it's on slide number 39. So <laughs> I'm only about halfway there. The problem with this is there's a lot of vocabulary and a lot of, it's, it's a lot of, what do they call it, um, uh, concepts without the practical um, seeing it. Uh, if I could show it to you, I would. The only problem is it requires so much resources. It's impossible. So a lot of theory. A lot of theory is what this is. That's what I meant to say. So I'm going to try and make it as, I don't know, as less dry as I possibly can. But this is pretty dry material, I have to admit. So <laughs> Even I'm getting bored just listening to myself speak. So <laughs> That's why I take little breaks to lighten it up a little bit. Okay. All right, back to boring stuff. <laughs> transaction attributes. I can kind of skip through some of this stuff, too. What is a transaction attribute? And more vocabulary. It's a value associated with the method of an enterprise bean that uses container-managed transaction demarcation. Oy. Well, we got transaction demarcation, I hope, at this point. We got attributes and attributes. So it's just an attribute of the transaction. It's just something we're looking for. So a transaction attribute is defined 
for an enterprise bean method in the beans deployment descriptor using usually by an application component provided provider or an application assembler. Hey. <laughs> okay. The transaction attribute controls how the bean container demarcates the transaction. Okay, so we're just basically setting the blueprint, the template, the attributes, the information that we're going to be looking for per the bean activity, and we're giving it to the manager, transaction manager from a container level. In most cases, all methods of the enterprise bean will have the same transaction attribute. Otherwise, you're really, you're really nitpicking if you go down with each method having a different transaction attribute. So here are some of the transaction attributes to put this into perspective and some of the settings that are associated with it. Required. Well, we, we've already actually seen required new a few minutes ago, but required. This is the default transaction attribute to ensure that the methods are invoked within the transaction API transaction. Causes the enterprise uh, being to use existing transactional context if it exists or to create one if it doesn't exist. <coughs> Basically, it says it has to run with the transaction, the JTA, otherwise it's not going to run. It's required. Required new means a new instance of it. So using <coughs> used when the result of the method must be committed regardless of whether the caller's transaction succeeds. And then logged is a uh, logging is a good example. Must uh, well, yeah. Logging would basically tell us what's going on. <coughs> Supports another attribute uses the method that either uses yeah uh, used for methods that either do not change the database or update automatically, and it does not matter if the updates occur in a transaction. Okay. Mandatory used when the method absolutely requires an existing transaction. Can't get away without it. Never. Is to ensure that your transactional client does not access methods that are not capable of participating in the transaction. Not supported. <clears throat> Use when the enterprise being access resource manager that neither does not support transa external transaction demarcation or not supported by JTEE. So. Alright, so here's an example of some live source code for you. Not that this is going to be any less dry than the material itself. But here's the university registrar session being example. And if you remember when I was going over the RMI, we did the Ask the Registrar program. And the Ask the Registrar program was using an RMI routine. Did not contain any transaction management. Did not contain any bean technology. Didn't do anything. So if we add a little bit more and put a session bean on there. The session bean is keeping track of the current transaction and it is the session. It's actually the same thing that we use in terms of um, web programming, session content. Keeps track of environment variables, keeps track of the username, password, stuff like that. Um, so we can get the university name up here, get the reference. We can start the transaction. If it fails, then we can throw an exception on the Java bean and say, hey, you know, transaction failed. So. Here's what the source code actually sort of looks like if we would put it together. Transaction object up here, user transaction, create a new instance of this object, run the begin on the object, perform the transaction itself, and then we have transaction.commit, transaction.rollback if it didn't work. Um, so it kind of puts the pieces of the material into perspective a little bit in terms of what it is you're doing. And imagine you're just building a, an object to keep track of the transaction. And you're committing and you're, you're rolling back, essentially, just the same way as you would manually do it on a database, in a database session. Uh, but usually the programmer itself has to, you know, figure out how to do that. Um, you know, usually when you're working with a database, you're manually typing in commit or rollback or something of that nature. All right, so this is a really good stopping point, actually, uh, because the next part of this lecture is going to move on to web tiering and servlets. So what I just gave you was an overview of the Java Transaction API, which you do not have to implement. If you want some more information, I believe this, this list 
actually let me just test it real quick. Uh, Java transaction architecture spec, it should bring it up, and it does. Look at that. So if you click on that link in the lecture and you can come up here and you can read all about the transaction API, JTA. And um, more than you'll ever want to know about it. <laughs> so, so don't necessarily be concerned with, um, let me see if I can get back to that lecture. Oops, wrong one. And don't be concerned with not knowing all the intricate details about this API. What you want to get out of this lecture and the thing to remember is the vocabulary because the vocabulary is pretty consistent among other technologies of the same sort. A transaction is a transaction. Demarcation is demarcation. Distributed systems always have the same issues associated with transactions. I mean, because you don't have a centralized point for the control. So in essence, what you're doing is creating a centralized point of control for all of the different pieces that are spread out all over the network. So. I think it's not a bad idea to break for lunch, actually, because uh, we're halfway through. When we come back, this is about 88 slides off. This is part one, end of part one. When we come back, I'm going to start in with part two, which is going to get into servlets. Uh, and uh, there is an assignment that you'll need to do on servlets. Those are that is something that you can implement easily. Questions, comments, or concerns? No, a lot of people just showed up. <laughs> Let me stop this video.